welcome to the stage the one, the only Mr. Nico McBride! Yeah. Well, no, but, um, <laughs> shut up. <laughs> I've got a drum tech. <laughs> I don't think after tonight I'm going to have one. <laughs> <laughs> Good evening. Good evening. Good evening.
my goodness. Well, hey, first of all, big hand for my dear friend Al Murray. Thank you so much, mate. Get a few fangies out of the way. Let's put our appreciation for our sound man. I don't know your name, mate. What's your name? Cloth ears? Do you like it out the back? You like swiddling the knobs, you know. Ross. Ross. Wasp. Ross. 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 <laughs> I'm sorry, mate. I'm, I'm not supposed to be taking the mickey, but let's give a, a, a great appreciation to our sound guy. Ross at the back. We've got Mark, our stage manager. So, mate, thank you so much. Um, who wants a stick? One of you. One of you. Oh, steady. This is a family show. Thank you for that wonderful warm, warm welcome. I need a drink. I mean, not that kind of drink, a nice drop of water in the set. Thank you for that wonderful introduction, mate. My pleasure, Nico. And I, I love it, the fact that you got all you lot clapping, because that was shit, that solo, and I thank you very much for that wonderful <laughs> rapturous round of applause. Thank you so much. <laughs> no. Um, so, mate. Should we sit on the side? Should, should we have a, take a cosy? Yeah, why not? Yeah. Hey. So, yeah, I guess, like, the, the, the whole vibe of the evening, <laughs> just before I sit down with him, it's, it's more of an informal evening. It's not so much about a lot of drumming, although we will, we're going to be playing a little bit later on. In fact, I'm going to play his drum set, and he's having a go on mine. And, actually, Al came up with this wonderful idea about, we're going to ask, you know, a little question and answers from you lot a little later on. But we're thinking, hey, what is your idea? Yeah, we might um, get one of you up to play alongside Nico. <laughs> Nico. Yes, mate. Um, we, we have a room full of fans. People like, we want to ask all sorts of questions. But, but first of all, I mean, you know, classic straight up drumming interview question. Yeah. How did you get into playing the drums? Uh, good question. I'll answer it, because I've been put on the spot, right? <laughs> no, um, I was about 10 years old, and uh, Dave Brubeck, a quartet, had a song out called Take Five. You know it. Anyway, in, when, back in the 60s, when I was 10 years old, we didn't have... Oh, yeah. <laughs> I know I don't look it. No need to rub it in. <laughs> Sometimes um, there is a need to rub it in. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's what they call that ointment for the old names and names, you know. Um, and there was no, it was all live telly yeah. in the 60s, way, way through the 60s. No VTRs and whatnot. <coughs> Excuse me. Excuse me. So, Dave Brubeck playing, and in the middle of it, Joe Morello, who was the drummer, did a drum solo. Well, it was, it was as though God had sort of opened the clouds and gone, here, we'll have some of this. Because it, it, it was a, a really moving moment for me. I just I went straight up to the table, black and white telly in those days. Dad was doing the ironing, as he did on a Monday night. It was a Monday night, I think, he was doing the ironing. <laughs> and I looked at this guy doing this drum solo, and I was absolutely blown away. And I said to my dad, who's that fella there? Who's that drummer? I said, I want to do that, like, I want to be like him. You know, Joe Morello, son. I said, Joe who? He said, Joe Morello. I said, oh, I want to, I want to play Joe. I want to be that. I want to be that guy. And he, and he had this, he had these kind of tinted glasses because he had poorly eyesight all through his life. And um, I said, I want to be that dark sunglass guy. You'll never be as good as Joe Morello, son. I went, oh, right, Dad. I thanks a lot for the vote of coffee. I didn't think like that. I just thought, well, I was nearly going to swear then. Yeah. It begins with B and ends in X. So I went out in the kitchen and I picked up two men. Uh, uh, <laughs> so I picked up a pair of my mum's knives out of, out of a cutlery drawer and I beat the nine living daylights out of a cooker. Now in those days, the cookers we got a day, they're kind of, I don't know what they use, but they, it was bait, it was like... Um, it was enamel, was it? Enamel, and it was chipping all off. Next thing, my mum comes in the kitchen, she goes, Ah! Harry! Get in it! Harry's my dad's name. Gary, get in there! There's all these pieces of enamel. I'm, I'm, I'm Joe. <laughs> <laughs> my old dad came in, clubbed me around the back of the ears, he said, Give me that pair of knives! What do you think you're doing? He said, you, You've really messed it up for me, son. You'll understand one day. Well, I now understand what my dad was on about. 
<laughs> you know, when, when you get married, you've got kids, and the missus moans at you, you ain't getting any for a week. <laughs> if you're lucky. And it's a Monday. And it's a Monday. <laughs> <laughs> so that was it, it inspired me and for about a year yeah. I, I made the most incredible drum set you could possibly imagine. It, exponentially every week it would grow and it was consisted of biscuit tins, oxo cube tins, tobacco tins, I, uh, I had a couple of oxo tins and I put earth in one of them to change the note, to make it denser so it didn't same, sound the same. So and uh, I used to take it on the road with me. I'll take it out of the bedroom, down to the, lab, the front room in the house. <laughs> and I'll set it up. That's where the gramophone record was, and I'd play along to records. So that's how it started. Right, wow. And yeah. then, and your parents then had to take that seriously? They did. They, well, well let, let's put it this way. When my dad, my mum and dad gave me my, my drum set, I was 11 and a half, year, uh, 11 and a half years old, and uh, at Christmas. So I'd, I'd been thrashing around on biscuit tins and whatnot for about a year drove my mum up the wall because the, 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 she used to do a lot of crocheting and knitting yeah. and she was using these metal knitting needles, these like five B knitting needles yeah. and I'd nick them because my drum sticks are stashing and I'd be upstairs in the bedroom, MICHAEL! See, if, if, if it was Michael, I got into serious trouble. If it was Nicky, I was alright. MICHAEL! Oh, oh. <laughs> At least it's my mum, it ain't the old man giving me a ring and I'm moaning up. Where's my five bees? She'd say. <laughs> oh, all right, so I'll have to go and give them up. But when they finally gave me my drum set, my dad turned around and said to me, Ooh, it's not a bloody five minute wonder. And I said, no, no, it ain't that. And my dad then, as, as I went moving along and playing in local bands and whatnot, he realised that it wasn't a five minute. So right from the start, you knew what you wanted to be a drummer. After seeing that was your calling, your Absolutely. vocation, like yeah. this is what I've got to do. And you would have thought I'd be playing jazz, wouldn't you? Really? But it, I mean, I've played a few little drum gigs, not very well, but you know, little jazz swing stuff. But I, I grew up listening to my dad's and mum's music. My mum was into Frank Sinatra and Nat King Cole. Yeah, and dad didn't like that. He didn't mind so much about Nat King Cole, but Mum was really like in besotted with Frank. And Dad, he, he was not happy. Mum would go, Harry, there's a new Frank Sinatra album out. Let's go down and buy it. Boy, we ain't having none of that. He's go, oh, I don't like Frank Sinatra. Because he was jealous, you know? <laughs> but um, my dad was listening to people like um, Oscar Peterson, uh, Benny Goodman, uh, 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 George Shearing. So there was a lot of swing and jazz in my house being played. Although I wasn't really sitting there going, oh, well, I'm going to do that one day. So I kind of, my influence sort of started there, I think. And then when I saw Joe thrashing that, you know, thrashing that solo, it was stunning. And, and that's, that kind of sowed the seed. Yeah. And then it's grown. It's and, then you, and then you're playing pubs, clubs. Yeah. And then, and then how old were you when you like could say, because when I, when I started out as a comic, it was two or three years before I could sit in a taxi and say to the cab driver, I'm a comedian, without feeling like <coughs> embarrassed or like a fraud, you know, because you, you know you want to do it, you know you've got to learn, you've got to get your craft together, but there's a moment where you think, well, oh, that, that is what I am, and you're earning money from it. When was that for you? Well, it, it kind of was when I was a teenager. I, I, I was going to stay on for GCSEs at school, you know, and I, I was planning, I had a couple of different local bands that I played with, and uh, we started to make a fairly good, you know, like semi pro You know, everyone was working, all the other guys were working. Um, I then thought I'm good enough to be able to go pro when I was 16. And, but mum was, I don't know how many guys in the audience have got parents, you know, and then they're playing drums. So you have, say you're, how, you know, you're a teenager, right? Yeah, and mums and dads, you've got to listen to them because my mum was this, you've got to get a trade, son. Well, she didn't say it like that. Then go and get a trade, son. <laughs> <laughs> Dad was like, oi, listen to your mother. <laughs> <laughs> Do it for me. Okay, Dad. Um, so mum was very, you've got to go and, and get a trade. I said, mum, music is a trade. And she said, no, because it's such a fickle industry that if something doesn't happen or you go out and you make it for a few years and then you hit hard times you've got a trade to fall back on and that was the way and the mentality and the thinking between you know pre-war 
or post wars. But I think a lot of people, a lot of people here, will be encountering that now. Yeah. Um, especially people in their teens who are thinking, oh, I fancy being a drummer and yeah. you still got to go to uni or whatever or, or exactly. get, get a trade together. I, I opted to go to work uh, with the, on the premise that I'd go and do a job, not go through the, the fifth year of school for the GCSEs and get a job and then go pro. But mum was so adamant, and this was my father again, do it for me, son. Just do it for me, do what your mum asks you. You'll understand mum. Right? And he always kept saying that to me. I go, what's he on about? What's he mean? He's going to understand one day. I go, it's now that I'm worried about that. I want to be a player. You're, I know you're good enough, son, but you do it for your mum. Anything for a peaceful life for me. Just do it. <laughs> All right, Dad. You know, so really, there was a bit of peer pressure from mum and dad. So I went to Southgate Technical College. And my first job when I left school, I was a carpenter. And it lasted two days. And I was working for a company called Stocks Contractors. And they took me to this building site and they had me filling in trenches with cement. And I said, yeah, where's the wood? And they said, well, you've got to prove yourself. You've got to be a labourer for a wee while. And well, I wasn't having any of that. So this is where I started to learn, like, I'm not having any of this, you know. This gets, got me into a lot of trouble, believe me. <laughs> <laughs> and it, like, that's right, and it lovely. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, we'll go into that in a bit, but... <laughs> we can go to that right now if you want. So, well, I turn around and told the foreman to stuff it where the sun don't shine. I, you know, if I'm not, I'm, I'm, I'm supposed to be indentured, you know, learning carpentry, carpentry and joinery. And so I left that and I ended up working with a, um, a bottle company that made glass bottles out in Bounce Green in North London. So I, I flipped from job to job, but the, the next job after that I had was, was plastic injection moulding. Place, uh, Horns, Horns B and Clark with a company. Same estate as the bottle company. And the, the charge hand was a really, he, he was a real mu music lover and he knew, yeah, okay, Nick, you've got something special, you know, you, you know you're know, you always late for work, you're missing days out of work, you know. But they said, we're gonna train you to be a mechanical engineer, not the kind of mechanical engineer like sorting out motor cars. Mechanical engineers back in the 60s were guys that would work lathes, mills, um, uh, you know, grinding machines, making blueprints and making stuff out of mill. Yeah. So I went to college for four years to Southgate Tech and I got a city and building mechanical craft practices, it was called. So here's, you, want to hear this, you want to hear the continued story? So to yeah. answer your question about when I knew that I would, that was it, was the day I, let, I was working for a company called Zales that were making anemometers. For you youngins, do you know what an anemometer is? No. No. Neither do I. <laughs> it's a, a measuring device for gases, various different gases, and they, 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 I, I had to work on what was called a cup generator anemometer, which was, when you see the cups spinning around at airports, it measures the wind speed and pressure, and barometric pressures. Yeah. A lot of mercury involved in those days, believe me, that's not good. So you don't want to touch that stuff, but I, 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 I work with it, that's why I'm like that. <laughs> I'm like that while I'm talking to you. Um, so, I'd had enough, and I was working with these two songwriters, a guy called uh, Mike Leslie and Billy Day, and I was the only one in the band who had a driving license, so I had the van, Dan Van, and we had a deal on the table with CBS Records. That's another long story, but... I, 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 I knew, I was 21 years old, and I went, that's it, I've had enough. And I went up to the charge and the, 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 the job, and I said, right, I'm going home. I'll no longer work with you lot. And, uh, you know, whatever you owe me for the week, and, you know, severance and this, that, and the other. Because I've been working with this company for a few years. Um, I went home. And I walked in, the, and my mum was home from work. She had a couple of jobs, and she worked at a, a golf course, and then a news agent. And she was going from one job to the toilet, but she'd go home first and change and whatnot. And she says, oh, you're home a little late for lunch. I said, yeah, 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 you know. And I, had, I was trying to summon up the courage to tell her, mum, I'm not working anymore, I'm going to pro. I'm, I'm actually, as of today, a pro player. And uh, she said, oh, but this came for you. And it's on my life, the City and Guild's results came through that morning, through the, through the post. And I get up, pass with honours, lovely, or with distinction. Yeah. Oh, oh yeah, why are you home? She said, I said, see that mum? 
<laughs> it's no word of a lie. I said, I've done what you've asked me to do. I am a trained mechanical engineer or, you know, a craft practice engineer. I've actually gone to work with Mickey and Billy and they were based out in Dunstable and they paid me 50 quid a week to play with them, which in 19... Well, I was 21, so that was... 1904. <laughs> Just before the Great War. <laughs> and that's when, that's when, that moment, when I got home, I could say, I'm now a pro player and I never look back. Brilliant. Brilliant. So, yeah. And who, uh, apart from Joe Morello, who were the people you were, who, who's playing with you digging at that point? Oh, well, that's easy. It was uh, the great Ringo Starr, first of all. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> Give me out the Ringo, without a doubt. Such a fluid player. I mean, his timing was just immaculate. And he, a left handed player, playing a right handed kid. Yep. So he tended to leave, you know, lead left hand, and, but he had the little swing. Beatles. Did you did love that? New kids. <laughs> Mums and dads. Who saw the Beatles live? How many people in this room saw the Beatles? Come on! Put your hands up! Is that it? Is it just me? I can't see anyone else with their hand up. You're over the laugh! There's one hand up over there, I think. Right, 1964, Finsby Park Astoria. It was a Christmas extravaganza party. I couldn't hear them, but they were there. And the most, the, the most cherished memory I have from that night was the smell of urine <laughs> and the screaming of you lovely ladies. Ah, no, John, I love it! The wee wee just flowing down, no problem. Good job I weren't wearing flip flops or bare feet in it, days, wasn't it? So Ringo was my first guy, and I had, I had a big, he was my first pin up as a, as a drummer. And I had a picture of him on my wall every night, and I'd go to sleep looking at it, you know, and going, oh man, you know, this, this guy is just oh, unbelievable. <laughs> then it was uh, the Rolling Stones with Charlie Watts. Woo! <laughs> yeah. These are the four guys that sort of moulded my, you know, my journey, if you like. Um, I was playing in pop bands and soul bands in the early, you know, in my early teens. So um, then the Who came out, my, my generation. Oh my lord. I thought, that, 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 that whoever this guy is on the drum kit, he ain't well. There's something not right with him. You know? And I was right, wasn't I? So, 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 you know? But he, he just completely changed the tapestry for me. And then, yeah, a couple of, not even a couple of years later, we had the one and only John Bonham. Yeah, yeah those four guys. Now, you might say to me, what about Ginger Baker? Well, what about Ginger Baker? What about? Would be my reply. <laughs> I mean, it, <laughs> he wasn't as good as me. That's all I'm going to say. <laughs> <laughs> you saw the show last night, oh, didn't you? <laughs> yeah, well, well, he wasn't as good as me, was he? Oh, oh no. No, look, Ginger was great. He had, you know, he had this incredible flair, um, and he was a three-piece playing in a three-piece band, as well as John was, really. I mean, we had Roger, you know, Robert Plants up there singing, but there was just a bass, you know, John Paul Jones, and, and, and you know the wonderful G JP, three piece. So the drumming in in, in that period of the sixties, it became a drummer wasn't just a timekeeper like Ringo and and uh, and uh, Charlie. Charlie. They become percussion drummers where they would fill and music the musicality of the playing started to expand. And obviously, Ginger with a you know doing these double bubbles, you know, and he's, he's old toad and he's so lovely. But then you look at John Bonham, one pedal, and you know, he, he, he had the, he, before Star Wars came out, he had his Star Wars moment, didn't he? Hey? He did the hand solo. <laughs> <laughs> you know that one, didn't you? No, I'm not using, I, I'm not you using You can use it, mate, I know. <laughs> now, the, thing, the thing about Bonham, right, I always think it's quite, at that point in the 60s, he crystallises all the other things that people are doing. Yeah, Mitch yeah. Mitchell's playing isn't quite doing oh, that. Yeah. Ginger's playing isn't doing that. But it's like it's almost like he takes he takes Ringo's backbeat sensibility and puts it into, puts yeah, it into rock yes, music. Yeah. And suddenly you have the guy who's doing the thing that everyone's still trying to do. But without a doubt. I mean, th th there were two amazing things I found that influenced me with John. Was one is sound. Yeah. His drum set. Of course, he was using a 26 inch bass drum, you know, 14 inch tom, 18 floor, or whatever. The bigger drums, square size. 
but the power, and he did, but the thing is, he, he, he was effortless. Yeah. He wasn't like, you know, when I was playing, when I was, for, for Joy first John Maiden, I'd have my drumstick back here, yeah. and this one back here, trying to break everything, <laughs> to hit hard and be powerful. Well, it's not about that. It really is a lot of wasted energy. And but, so John worked that one out, and he actually played his drumstick almost halfway down it. You know, not like where we traditionally hold it, where we have half an inch out from the back end, you know. And uh, so he had the sound and the, the, that just that touch. touch. Yeah. yeah, it was his touch and his tone, wasn't it? Because you could put him on any drum kit and it could sound Absolutely. like Absolutely. I mean, he was just, I mean, Jason, his, his boy, is, yeah. he's, he's really pulled a lot of his dad recently into his playing, which is, is wonderful here because we, we've got a legacy. You know, John's left this amazing legacy and Jason's kind of living that. But uh, those four guys were the, were the primary, um, you know, and then of course, a little bit later on, we, we had the one and only fantastic Ian Pace in 1968. Uh, not only was there this incredible drummer, Lefty, right, there was this incredible freaking band. I mean, wow, look, you know, it was just off the charts, all that stuff in the six, late 60s. Yeah. So there, I started to have favourite drummers after the four guys that really influenced me. Yeah, you know, yeah. Now, talking about John Bonham, he was one up, one down, wasn't he? Or sometimes one up, two down. Yeah, yeah. What's going on here? <laughs> well, explain yourself. It's uh, <laughs> one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine up. <laughs> one down. Two, two, two down. Right. Snare drum. Oh, yeah. You yeah, forgot yeah, the yeah, snare. Yeah, you keep yeah. forgetting that one up, two, two, two down. down. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. No, two down, you're right. One up, two, two, yeah. the floor tom and the snare drum, see? So how did you get into playing such a... Um, Okay, gigantic yeah, here's, here's, here's the true story. I okay. I, my first drum set I bought was a summer. It was a teardrop, red, uh, marine, rip, like a marine ripple. I forget what they actually called it. Is, have we got the sound of boys in tonight? <laughs> There's a fella down there with a camera, and he put his finger up. Like I can't see him. There's a poxy camera in his face. Anyway, no. They, so they had the the sonar teardrop kit, four kit. You know. Yeah. One up, two down. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Uh, 22 inch bass drum, and I bought that was my first kit. Then I went out to buy a Ringo drum set from Top Gear in Denmark Street. Yeah. And I was, uh, was 1966, around that period. I was at 16 years old. So I had the Sona kit for about a year, and I thought, oh, well, I desperately want like, a super classic love it. Yeah. Marine Oyster finish, you know, Ringo's drum set. So I saw in the Melody Maker, they had this, uh, they had all the um, listings of musical instrument, you know, retailers, you know, Drum City and Charles yeah. Avenue, Top Gear and all these other places. Yeah. And they had, a, they had this, this lovely, you know, 200 quid or something like that. And for right, I'm gonna go and buy it. So I go down to Top Gear and I walk in, there's a super classic in the corner. And on this riser lit with these lights was a George Heyman silver drum set. Anybody familiar with the George Heyman drum kits? Yeah. No? Yeah. Well, yeah. Uh, well, well, I'll tell you, they, it was an English fella, came up with this, this idea called a vibrosonic shell, and we basically lacquered the inside of the wood to give it more projection. We do that nowadays with different stuck types of wood, denser woods, lighter woods, birch, you know, uh, maple, uh, bubinga, mahogany. beech wood, mahogany, oak, all kinds of stuff. And, and it depends on the ply to give the, the, the definition of the resonance of the drum. But he did this vibe or something. Anyway, Simon Kurt was a big user of, uh, in, uh, in Free. Yeah. And um, John Eisman used them. And uh, they, you can still see a few of them about. But I've still got my original kit. So the second drum set I bought was the Heyman. Now, I joined Pat Travers in 1976. How did that go? That was really fantastic. Two marvellous albums with Pat. Um, but. When I, we did, we started rehearsal on, on um, Making Magic, I actually used the Heyman drum set. Yeah. And a couple of staccato drums. Mm -hmm. I, oh, right, yeah, the, yeah. The, 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 Did anybody know the staccato drum? Which is, the, it's like a north, it's bent like a banana. Uh, but the, but the, the north drums were circular. This, this drum had a, 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 a vein in it, like a, a different shape. It wasn't circular. But it had the bend in it. Anyway, they were fiberglass, they weren't really that great. But it complemented this this wonderful Heyman I had. It was a, actually it was a two up now. Yeah. You know, twelve thirteen. So getting there. Getting there. 
So when I so we go out and tour with we making magic and Pat goes, Nick, um, we we were getting ready at the end of tour and he says, I think we need to get you a you know, a big F off drum set. And I went, Really? Why? What's wrong with that? He said, Well no, he said like we, we we're starting to get popular, you know, and we're getting bigger gigs, we're going to America and this, that and the other. And he said, um, why don't we get a double bass drum kit? <laughs> <laughs> I said a double bass drum, why? He said, no, because it's everybody's using it, like Cozy Power and all the, you know, these other drummers have got double bass drums. I said, look, mate, I'm happy with what I got. He said, well, look, we'll pay for a, you know, we'll pay you to, to get a bigger kit. What do you want? Ah. <laughs> what do I want? Well, all of them. Anyone, <laughs> yeah, all of them. So, in 75, Sona introduced a drum set called the Sona Phonic XK9212 series. It was a two bass drum set, concert rack, 6, 8, all the way down, the same size as the last drum, except for these are square sizes, except for the little 6 inch, that's a 6 by 8 the little teeny weeny one around there. I very rarely hit it. As you know, it's like I can only hit it when I stand up. Huh? <laughs> so, Pat, in, you know, he inspired me. He said, look, let's, let's get a bigger kit, get a double bass. So uh, I went to um, uh, Tottenham Court Road, the music shop down there. It was at like, Fender Sound House. Yeah. And I walked in, I had this Sony catalog, and I've opened up first page, smack in the middle of this magazine, was this beautiful silver concert tom kit, two bass drums. I went, well, that's what I'm going to have. Sony, you know, my first kit I bought was Sony. So I did a deal with a, a guy called Gordon Wilkinson, who worked up in Birmingham, for, and he was a Sony rep. But he, when I said to him, you know, can I get a deal with, with the Sonor drums? He said, oh, he said, oh, they don't give their drums away. He said, oh, I can do your deal. I said, what kind of deal? He said, oh, it's 30% of my cost, maybe some percentage, but you've got to give me your drum set. I went, what, well, Heyman? Mm -hmm. I went, no, no, I'll give you 100 quid. That shame, huh? So he went, all right. <laughs> so we did a deal on the first kit. Went off with Pat. We recorded Putting It Straight, the second album on that kit. I went off, did a tour. We went around America and Canada uh, supporting a band called, who remembers a band called Mahogany Rush? Yeah? Jimmy Ayub, the drummer. Um, Frank Marino on guitar. Forget the bass player's name. It's funny how you forget the bass player's name. <laughs> Unless you, yeah. unless you've been in Maine for very five years. <laughs> anyway, so long story even longer. Pat decided to fire me halfway through the tour, and uh, I came back to England to sort out some tax issues that were hung over from other bands I've worked with, Prior Streetwalkers being one of them. Anyway, I got a phone call from David Hemmings, his manager, and I was I was living in a flat in Kilburn with uh, my first wife, not Rebecca, <laughs> Catherine, and um, we weren't actually married then, but um, I said, Kathy would answer the phone, she said, oh, there's a bloke called David Emmons on the face, David, you, you, you. hello, David, are you? You brought me. Guess where he lived? <laughs> Glasgow. <laughs> he says, you brought me. I said, yeah, I'm fine. He said, uh, I've got some bad news. I went, have you? What's the matter? He said, we're going to park company. I said, well, where are you going? <laughs> <All right. laughs> he said, no, not you, not me, you sobby sod. He said, you, your Pat doesn't want to work with you anymore. Uh oh. And I'm thinking of all these things in here, or I'll get him, I'll give him some of this, and I'll say, what about my drunk here? I said, ah, you pay for that, we'll send it to you. I went, hang on a minute. I, I was basically shafted and Pat kept my drum set. So that was a big bugbear for me, believe me. So I've then gone back to Arna Carter Management, who were the umbrella of Michael, Mike, uh, Jim Dawson and Mike Dolan, and uh, they managed the tourists, Annie Lang's band, Judas Priest, a bunch of other bits and pieces, Pat Travis. So I've gone steaming into the office, Oi, you need to buy me a new drum set. So we bought another kit. Yeah. Right. Didn't have to give her, I had no drum set to give him, you know, I mean, I'd have my Heyman. Yeah. Thank God I didn't give it to Gordon Wilkinson. Anyway, 
um, that drum set is in my warehouse, the maiden warehouse, and I saw it actually, what day is it? I saw it this week. Uh, Craig and I from John One, we went up and did a stock take on all my drum sets. Uh, it's not silver anymore, it's actually yellow. <laughs> it's oxidised. Um, but it was the album I, the, the drum set I used on Peace of Mind. Right. So, Pat, going, getting down to the actual question, dear Al, yeah. it was down at, <laughs> it was down at Travers. Right. That inspired me to go big. Now, this but you, but you said two kick drums, and you don't play double kick, and you're renowned for having a very, very fluid, fast, single foot yeah. technique. Why don't you play two kick drums with a double pedal? Oh, it's a good question, isn't it? Now, I was quoted years ago saying it's very undrummerish, it's very unmusical. <laughs> and I really spoke out of turn because it's not that. I just felt that I didn't want to um, use two because I found one was hard enough. <laughs> why, why compounding issue with two? But that's fact, in fact, when you learn to play with two bass drums and you use your left limb, it becomes easier to do quarter note fills and stuff like that. Instead of a tub double bass drum on the right, you know, you get the drift, right? Um, so. I just thought, oh, I don't want to use two, you know, I mean, I've been practicing on one forever and I just didn't have that, that gene in me that said, yeah, go for it. I mean, I've sat at home and played with a double pedal and believe me, once you get into it, it's very hard to remove yourself from it because things start, you start thinking to yourself, oh, that sounds really good. <laughs> oh, mate, it'd be great in that middle bit of <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I decided, made a conscious, conscious decision not to go with two, two right. bass, bass drums, or a one, one bass drum with two pedals. I have used a, a double bass drum pedal on a song called Face in the Sand, off of what album was it, Boys and Girls? Dance to Death, was it? Oh god, I mean, it's a long time ago that was. Now, here's a quick story for you, right? I struggled. Adrian Smith wrote it at this time. He had a drum pump and he had a double bass drum. It was really, really good. I mean, Craig Blundell would be absolutely amazed with this part, you know. I mean, he's seriously, whatever it was. And he says, Who can play that? We won. I said, Very, very nice. Thank you for the vote of confidence, Adrian. But I can't. I've got about two, two and a half bars of it, and I could probably, that's, that's me. Yeah. So I had to do this back. So, sat there, it sounds cool, right? That sounds sounds like if I do that again. <laughs> That's the hill. That's still down. <laughs> so, it's a bit more right. Anyway, so, here's a, here's a true story. Got in the studio, we learned the song. It goes from there to there in about two seconds. <laughs> Harry goes, don't worry about that, it sounds good. It's, it's, it's got a problem, isn't it? Oh. <laughs> That's a five pound note in the swear box. And we recorded it. And the, the, obviously when you're recording and you're under the microscope, everything you do, you know, if you miss a stick and you hit the rim or you catch the hi-hat, you're gonna catch it on, you know, whatever format you're recording. And that, that time, that album we recorded analog and bounced it because I didn't want to go digital, which was a really you know a waste of time because as soon as you transfer the magnetic signal with digital, it's digitised, right? But I wanted that hiss, that that kind of there's something about magnetic tape that's totally different to digital music. You know the signal is all numbers and stuff, right? Yeah. Anyway, we listen, and this was our sound. Almost flanning. Equal notes, but one was louder than the other. And I could not get my left foot to work the same as my right. So I thought, well, let's go the opposite way and not hit the right one as fast as hard as this one. And it just was a mess. I hadn't practiced at it, but I kind of got the meter in it resembling where it should be. So we went and did it again. And we did it again. And I'm getting on. Oh, gosh. Oh, no. I'm getting so frustrated. And Kevin says, Nico, come in here a minute. 
That's my South African accent, by the way. Come in here and sit down for a moment. He said, I want to show you something. So he gets the computer, the old Pro Tools, and he, he does something up on a click, 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 and then there's this graph, right? It's the, 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 the sound wave. He said, right, see that one there? I went, yeah. He said, that's your right foot. I said, well, that one there is obviously your left. He said, yeah, that's how you're playing it. The decibel difference, there's a, you know, an attack difference. Oh, that's what I know, I know that, I can hear it. That's what we're trying to, he said, hold on a minute. Presses another couple of buttons, gets the mouse, little cursor, goes with the one that's a little down, down low, and he goes, <laughs> well, he didn't go like that, but he, you know, he, he put the, little, the, the sound wave up to match the other one, press the, the save button, press play, and it's like, da 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 I said, you make me sound like Buddy Rich. <laughs> well, he don't use two pedals, but if he did, he would sound like that. I mean, it was just, it was using the technology. It was a cheat. And I, you know, I've, I've tell you the story now because I've told it before. I, and and now people say, oh, no, no, people don't go, they're going to think you can play double bass. Well, I can't. I cheated it. <laughs> what? Basically, basically, I, I, you know, my son plays double bass drum pedal, and he's he's just got the, you know, he's got the one bass drum. Yeah, he's got the twin pedal, and he's stunningly good. He's so so. Good. And you guys that that play, that's not a problem to play. I mean, everyone's pretty got pretty much got a fast voice. It's how you use it. Yeah, it's like any rhythm that you use, like how Ringo used his rhythms, and you know, come together and songs like that, and and, and just different. You know, we all, if we all sat and played a, a, you know, a particular feel, you know, maybe one of mine, I, I, I don't have to play it the same twice. <laughs> Sorry, what, what chance have you not got? Um, no, you, <laughs> so, you know, if you think about, we can all, we're all pretty good runners when, when we've got the police chasing us, right? Or something like that, you know, whatever. You know you can run, you can sprint. Your foot's doing this when you're running. A double bass drum player was the guy's doing that. All he's got to do is take the left out if he's a right-handed player. And he'd, he'd act as far as right foot. So we all know that you can do that. There's, there's guys that have got that speed. But it's, it's how I've used it with the bass player, with the, the, the truly the best heavy rock, you know, hard progressive rock bass player in the whole wide world. And I play with it. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, who would agree with that? Yeah. Yeah. I don't say it never because I don't regard him as a thank you. Um, I still forget his name. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, the, the, the double pedal thing is like, uh, you know, everybody, it's like anything else, you, you, you practice it and you get fluid at it and, and it becomes, it's not a chore. And when it is, then you think, well, I'll have to use two, like I did with Face in the Sand, because I couldn't do... Agent wrote it, he wanted a particular rhythm to it. I tried it on one, you know. Do that, do that, do that. Yeah, okay. And then it's like, <laughs> oh, no, I can't do it anymore, you know. Um, yeah, so my stamina wasn't there for a while. Now, now, you said earlier on you used to, when you first joined Maiden, Maiden you yeah. were like, hitting it really hard. You don't. The thing, when, the thing that I've, when I first saw you play on stage, when I, it was the Marshall um, yeah, uh, yeah. anniversary show, and I remember standing on the side of the stage and thinking, how interesting it was watching you, how fluid you are with the drum set, how you've got that right symbol yeah. over two toms. Yes. How on earth do you not hit the right symbol when you're going for those toms? I do. But, well, <laughs> <laughs> you, didn't, you didn't that night. Or if you do, you start it out. Uh, I, I'm really interested in, in, in essentially your, the, your economy of um, motion because you sit very low with your knees up and all that, which I think yeah. is quite unusual. Your snare drum up like that. How, did, how, how have you developed that playing style? How have you ended up there? Oh, that's a good question because, okay, going back to two up, one, two down, right, my Heyman kit, then I always played with the high, high hat. Right. I never played it down low, uh, you know, Simon Phillips' classic one, his, his hi-hat's just a little bit above his snare, there's a few drums, because he's got drums up here, 
He's got a ride symbol. He, he, he's very infamous for riding left side. Um, but that height, uh, the way I'd set my bass drum, and my snare drum, I used to play dead flat, and all my cymbals were flat. Uh, but as I put the staccato drum on, I, it would have meant that I, if I wanted to get them kind of not too high above the, 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 the 12, 13, I'd have had to take the hi hat down and chop the end of the, uh, the, the rod off, the clutch rod. Didn't want to do that. So I built the kit above it, keeping the basic, what I'd learned on, you know, with my Heyman and it, when I built my, my John Gray Broadway kit, my mum and dad bought me, I built that up with lots of symbols and I always play with a high high hat. So that kind of dictated why everything's so high. Um, then as, you know, when I, I, in 76, when I got the, the phonic kit, it was a 24 inch bass, I had two 24 inch bass drums. Um, so that, then, that's another couple of inches higher. Yeah. So uh, as I had this, the four, you know, six, eight, ten, twelve on the left above the hi hat. That's why they're so high. I can't really get them any lower unless I take the hi hat down. So I'd have to change my uh, the feng shui, if you like. Yeah, yeah. And the, the snare drum, as I've got as I've, <laughs> as I've got older, and, and I've got a really bad posture when I play. Now I'm trying to sit up a bit more, right? And uh, so I'll just explain in a minute what I did there. But as I went down, the snare went with me. And then when I changed from Sunrod to Premier in 92, Premier didn't have any really good hardware, no. to be very honest with you. They did, they got it together late in the later in life, but they they gave we built a rack, a Falicon rack for the for the from ninety two onwards. And the problem was I didn't quite get the rack right and I had to finagle the drum so I angled the toms even more, so they kinda of emulated that snare drum. Um, so now what I've done is the snare's actually come back up a bit. It still looks quite a heavy angle. Yeah. And I've flattened the tom toms and I've raised my stool from uh, the Book of Souls two or two years ago to the Legacy, uh, so that when I want to get up on the twelve and ten inch, I don't really hit the six and eight. Only at the end when I stand up, yeah. you do the bird's eye. You know. Um, so I flatten them. So when I actually have to go to the tom toms, I have to sit up and my posture is then better. And it's a lot easier on the back because you know what this is how I used to see. It. See how bent my back is. Yeah. So that that really the way the kit has, it has progressed over the years, it started to get really angled. Like you look at Lars Ulrich's drum set or Dave Lombardo, classic example. His drums are like that, yeah. and it was close. But that's how you know. There's no right way and there's no wrong way. To, to set your drum set up, it's what it's ergonomically works for you. But unfortunately, sometimes doing that, you know, setting your drum set over a long period of time, it doesn't do your back very good. This is why, you know, we look at the early days of Buddy Rich, he was, he was like hunchback. Just the way he played. And he sat quite high. But after but a week, to yeah, bend over to his drums. Yeah, yeah and he'd have that snare way like, you know, for, for the left hand, you know, orthodox grip um, so yeah that's really what happened over the years so now I've kind of gone back where it should have been I, I, can, I, I took a somewhere back in time drum set out for a photograph with Sonal three years ago when I went back with them and we took it out of the boxes and the last time that was used was for um, Be Quick or Be Dead video yeah right, way back in 90 whenever who, the, who knows when Be Quick or Be Dead was 92 right that was the last time that kit came out of the boxes before I had the photo shoot, and I sat on it, and I've gone, holy moly, everything's flat, yeah. but it wasn't. Yeah. So then it's I thought, relative. Yeah, 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 and I thought, I've got to set my Book of Souls drum kit like this, because it felt better, because over the years I've got lazy, and I've gone lower, and I've got lazy posture, and posture is really important to, to, to any, any way through your career of drumming is the, the way you sit, you've got to, it's a balance yeah. situation for me. To, to be able to get my foot working, I can't be too high. But there's other guys that want to be too high, they can't do it low. So what's, what suits you? But you've got to think, how's it going to affect me in the long run if I do have a long, long career as a musician? And I really hope that everyone in the room does that, that, that has a passion and love for the instrument. But we know that it's very difficult, right, boys and girls? How many people in a band here? Yeah, you know, it's, it's hard, it's tough, isn't it? 
you know, oh, give us a £500 note and you can come and play my gig. You know, you have to pay to play and all that sort of stuff. It's not like it used to be, you know, well, I'll give you a fiver and all the beer you drink. <laughs> yeah, they soon learn. <laughs> oh, blimey. Uh, I'll give you 20 quid and no booze, you know. <laughs> Well, should we should we play a bit now? Should we have a go? Yeah. Do you want to hear us play it again? Right? Yeah. Yeah.
going that hard. Huh? Going that hard. Oh, that's that's gone. Oh, that's all right. It's all right. It's all right. One of them funny things that sits around the broken family jewels. <laughs> no wonder he's always smiling. <laughs> Are you alright there, son? What's your name again? This is Aiden, isn't it? A Aiden? Aiden. Yeah, yeah. Alright, mate. <laughs> Put this microphone down now. Nobody touches it. There's a war theme, there's a cathedral theme, and there's hell. I said, well, I think we've got hell pretty covered, so I'd like to go to something war. <laughs> I want to do Where Eagles Dare. Bruce went, what? I said, yeah, Where Eagles Dare. Oh, what do you mean, oh? Well, it's a bit tough to sing, you know. This is the second Yeah, you because know, the war scene was the first five songs, right? And I thought, well, you asked me. I ain't changing my mind. <laughs> so Harry comes in the dressing room and Bruce says, Oh, Nick, you know the song Nick wants to do? Harry, yeah, where he was there. Because he wanted to play it too. <laughs> I always got a serious B ending an X for that song. So I'll have a go at it. You want to sing it? <laughs> Alright, let's have a go. Next tour, Alexander the Great. Nick, come and pray, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> 